And which war did you serve? I served in the Korean War. What branch? I was uh, in the U.S. Navy, uh, serving with the uh, Marine Corps. Okay, and what was your highest rank? Lieutenant Commander. And uh, just an overall general idea, what locations were you serving in? I started my service in Pensacola, Florida, transferred to Marine Air Wing in uh, El Toro, California, and then to uh, VMO-6 in uh, Korea. And were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. And uh, why did you enlist? I had just uh, finished uh, internship training after graduation of medical school in 1953. The draft was on. I had the opportunity of entering flight surgeon school in Pensacola, Florida, and I'd rather had I'd rather do that than go into the uh, army. Um, just as a lieutenant in in the medical division, I wanted to be a flight surgeon. And where were you living at the time when you enlisted? I was living in Brooklyn, New York. And. Just uh, what were your first days in the service like for you? Um, the first days in the service, I was really uh, a student at uh, the uh, training center in Pensacola, Florida, for flight surgeons. Um, I was a, I was an officer, um, second lieutenant. Well, Lieutenant Junior Grade, I should say. I was not in the Marine Corps at the time. I was in, still in the Navy as Lieutenant Junior Grade. And uh, it, was, it was a nice experience. I had uh, living in barracks, officers, and uh, got fascinated with uh, aircraft at that time in Pensacola. Uh, that was a major flight training center for the U.S. Navy. And so, so what were your, what was boot camp and basic training like for you? Well, it was, it wasn't as exhausting or down to earth, quote, as the rest of the enlisted personnel since I was an officer and I was a doctor. Mm. So uh, boot camp was really just going to school for, um, I think it was 12 weeks to flight surgeon school. We had uh, classes running from about nine in the morning to three in the afternoon. And then we had uh, flight training with the uh, Naval Aviation cadets from uh, three in the afternoon until early evening. And this was a, a daily routine. We did go through some military requirements, uh, uh, marksmanship, um, training for um, combat injuries, attending to combat injuries, and uh, trying learning how to evacuate wounded personnel from the field. So as a doctor, it, was, um, it wasn't an exhaustive basic training type of thing. Yeah. Um, so after boot camp, where did you go from there? Um, well, it wasn't really boot camp, but after at flight surgeon school, I, I went um, to um, flight school down in Pensacola, Florida, in order to get my naval aviator wings to learn to fly. And uh, from there, I was transferred to the 1st Marine Air Wing in El Toro, El Toro California. All military, all uh, medical personnel in the Marine Corps, as well as aviation personnel, were Navy people at that time. So all naval aviators that went into the Marine Corps, well, Marine aviators that were flying for the Marines were originally U.S. Navy aviators, and all medical personnel from the into the Marine Corps were Navy personnel. So there was a, a confluence of jobs, yeah. 
And so, uh, what what were assignments like for you uh, when you arrived in California? Did you have any or? Um, well, it was just some further training uh, in flying, um, and I was waiting orders, which eventually came after about four to six weeks while I was in El Toro, California, I transferred to Korea, the first Marine Air Wing in Korea. And what were your first impressions when you arrived in Korea? Well, I was shocked. Uh, we were, of course, we, uh, we, trans we landed originally in Japan, at Sugi, Japan, and um, stayed in Itsugi for a couple of weeks and then was shipped over uh, to these outposts in Korea. Mine was uh, Marine Observation Squadron number six, VMO six. And it was a uh, tent city uh, in some place of, uh, of forests and fields, no cities really, and it was, um, they had tents for both the pilots and enlisted men and other officers. It was about 30 some odd tents set up in this area. And how soon after you arrived there were you out in the field? Well that was the field. So what we, our basic mission over there uh, was to pick up wounded warriors from basically mesh type units and bring them to the field hospital in VMO6 where my station was, continue to administer care. And then when the patient became stabilized, they were transferred to hospitals uh, in Japan and back to the States eventually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, when you were in Korea, what was a typical day like for you? Well, um, I woke early in the morning, um, made uh, rounds on um, patients in the hospital, in our little hospital unit, and uh, I had two corpsmen with me, uh, took care of the medical needs, uh, spent a couple of hours flying aircraft, these were small L-19s, which were used for artillery observation. And also uh, patients that were ready for transfer to larger hospital units were made ready and brought to the airfield and put on helicopters and then transferred out. And that took up most of the day, came back, um, Sometimes I had to go with the patients, depending upon their type of illness or sustained injuries. Um, I would go uh, with the patients, um, come back to VMO6, uh, make hospital rounds again, early evening, and then the evenings were usually free. Um, so when you would be, so would you be flying out to the MASH units to, to pick them up? or was Sometimes um, we would be flying out to the MASH units to pick them up. Other times uh, we would take ambulances um, to pick them up, depending on where the unit was. And um, other times they were transferred from the unit to our unit. The times when you had to go and, and actually pick these guys up from the mass unit, were you ever scared that you would come under fire or any kind of attack? Did um, you ever come on, under any? Yeah, I, it was at the end of the war. Uh, it was winding down, and I had made this one trip with my two corpsmen in an ambulance to pick up a wounded serviceman. Um, it was... Uh, a good, at that time, a, a good hour's journey to reach the unit where he was. We picked him up, put him in the ambulance, and then started driving back to our unit. And we had to cross multiple streams. And in one stream, the ambulance stalled, probably from the water. And 
while we were sitting in the stream trying to start the ambulance, I, w I noticed a pinging sound on the ambulance. And at that time, I assumed it was rocks from the stream striking the, the ambulance. Finally got the ambulance going, got back to the M06 where our unit was. And when we went back to open the rear of the ambulance, we realized there were bullet holes in the ambulance. And the uh, serviceman who was in the ambulance was killed by these shots. So this was uh, an awakening moment. And from then on, I had a fear of uh, doing things like that and flying into areas that were still in combat zones, even though the war was was winding down. So so how long were you in Korea before that event had occurred? Was there ever a fear before then that you... No, I we was that? really not aware of combat. We were out of a combat zone. I, I was in Korea maybe two months at that time, or probably less than two months when I made that trip and had that terrible, terrible experience. Um, so what, when you get the injured uh, soldiers back to where you were, what kinds of uh, treatments did you give them? What kind of injuries were you seeing when they would come back to you? Were well, they, they, they were all sorts of war, war injuries. Uh, the more serious ones, uh, we try to uh, medevac quickly to larger hospitals um, in Japan. So uh, these were done at the same time. In other words, a patient was stabilized and transferred to a, another helicopter and transferred to Japan. Uh, the less he wounded were transferred to our hospital where they were stabilized a matter of days before they were transferred out. So. That was basically, it was a short stay. So would you perform surgeries there, or were those done at the mass units or then at the larger Well, hospital? sometimes surgeries had to be performed at the mass units, depending upon the extent of the injuries. If surgeries were performed at the mass unit and required um, more stabilization, we would do that in our unit. Uh, and then they would be transferred out. And sometimes the patients would come in needing surgery in our unit, and this is what we would do. Mm -hmm. So as, as, an, as a doctor, were you allowed to carry around uh, any weapons to protect yourself while out in the field during these Yes, times? We, uh, I had weapons, uh, mainly a revolver. And... Um, this was required any time we left the base itself. And did, were there any escorts with you, or was it just uh, you? There were no escorts. If I had to take an ambulance out, it was just the ambulance and my two corpsmen. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, aside from, from the event when you were stuck in the, the river, were there any other inst instances where you saw any kind of, of combat firsthand? Or? Oh, yeah. Um, in order to uh, gain flight time, um, I, I wanted to fly. So um, some of our helicopters um, would do um, uh, artillery observation. And I would also accompany them in a small Cessna type aircraft. It's called an LT-19, and um, I'd be flying with an artillery observer sitting in the front cockpit. I'd be flying from the rear, and uh, he'd be doing artillery observation. In those days, um, in order to pinpoint the artillery that we were firing over into the Korea areas, the North Koreans, uh, you had to have observation. So either the helicopter or the LT-19s would spot the sh artillery where they were shells where the shells were landing and how to make corrections for the aiming of the guns. 
so that they would fire more accurately. So I, I did some of this work too. In this day and age, you can sit in Indiana and, and fire shells without seeing enemy in Korea, you know, but we didn't have those situations that so uh, you had said earlier that you in California and in Florida those were those were for um, training for, yes for while you were going to be deployed do you feel that adequately prepared you for what you would be doing in the field when you got to Korea was it different than you expected were you well were there any surprises um, training and actually seeing wounded warriors is, is quite a bit of difference it's a shock I mean, you can talk about injuries, you can talk about um, surgeries that were done on um, dummies and um, models. And, uh, and then when you see the actual thing on young men, it was a shock, yes. So it was different. But the basic training allowed me to perform adequately in the field, even though I had to overcome an emotional situation when I first came there and saw it. And, and how did you get over that emotional I think emotion? just by doing it and by being there and, and, and to the time factor allowed me to adjust my emotions into the situation. So I was able to perform. Were there any times where you doubted your ability to help these people? No. I did the best I can. We were trained very well. And um, we did what we had to do. And we did it in a good way. So I had no qualms about that. Um, how, In your opinion, how do you think that battlefield medicine has changed over the years? Do you think it has gotten better or is it just... Oh, of course. Just like any, any other thing in medicine has changed. Uh, with uh, uh, antibiotics, uh, better surgical techniques, um, better ways of evacuating wounded, better aircraft. It's it just a matter as time went on, things got better uh, with our equipment and our abilities. So, so what what were the conditions like in in the uh, the hospitals that you were personally? Uh, working in and helping these soldiers, what, what were they like? Well, the hospital itself was a tent. Uh, we had about four tents, four hospital tents with um, probably 12 patients in each tent. So we, I would say about 50 patients was our maximum ability. I had three corpsmen and um, we performed very well with what we had, and our equipment was decent, was good. Um, if we needed supplies, uh, we had a good supply chain coming in from Japan, with from the uh, Marine uh, Air Station in Itsugi, Japan, and uh, didn't really lack anything out in the field at that time. Which was rare because back the people actually in the front lines, they were always hurting for, for supplies. So that were you, do you believe that you were put as a priority to? Yes. To as them? medical necessities, we will, I think we were put as a priori mm -hmm. priority. Yes. Um, so aside from, from flying out there or driving out there to, to pick up patients, were there any other duties that you had while you were, while you were in Korea? Uh, anything else that you would, no, I was, it was mainly medical duties, and uh, because of my flying capabilities, it was, I was allowed to do some artillery observation, a small airplane. Mm -hmm. um, so while you were while you were overseas, did you stay in touch with your family? Uh, by mail, we didn't have telephone connections, mm -hmm. so everything was letters. I wasn't married at the time. I just had two parents living in Brooklyn, New York, and we would exchange letters. That was about, yeah. And um, in in your time in Korea, did you yourself suffer any injuries? No, I didn't. 
<clears throat> so, I, well, I should say, I'll go back. <laughs> um, I suffered an injury not related to the war. Um, a point in my training before I got to Korea, I sustained a broken, a fractured collarbone. I was being lowered in training from a helicopter and I released myself a little too high up to get out and I fell, broke my collarbone. But that was, that healed well and I went on the rest of my duties. Um, so we, we kind of covered it a little bit, but I mean, flying, get going out there and picking up the patients and then bringing them back and taking care of them. Um, how much press and pre, uh, stress and pressure was on you in these moments to, to save these guys and to help them the best you could? Well, nobody exerted external pressure on, on us. It was what we felt in our heart and in our minds. Uh, the capabilities that we had, and to do everything to the best of our capabilities to sustain their injuries, help heal their injuries, and bring them to a safe situation. Um, and, and you'd already said that um, by by doing these, um, by taking care of them over and over again, it, it kind of eased the, the stress of the situation, but was there anything else that you did to, to kind of ease the stress and the pressure of, of all of these? Well, we had uh, what we called R&R, &R, rest and relaxation, and um, every so many weeks I was able to hitch a ride to Japan for an overnight in Japan, and at that time it was like going to New York City for a weekend. It, it, it was great. Uh, the people were nice, and uh, staying in a nice hotel and what have you. It was quite a comparison to where we were in Korea. It was always tough trying to go back to Korea. Um, I, how, did, how did the people, because you said you had um, nights free, was there any ways that everyone entertained themselves? And oh, we had movies uh, that were shipped over. Uh, from Japan. Um, we had um, some um, occasional, I wouldn't say Hollywood stars, but occasional entertainers that would come over and produce a little show. And uh, But most of the time we were on our own in the evening. I read a lot and we sat around and talked. And so, uh, did you see any USO shows while you were there, or was it just the the actors coming? No, the only USO shows uh, was I saw were uh, in Itsugi, Japan, where I was transferred after my duty in Korea. I was sent to the First Marine Wing in Itsugi, Japan, for. A month or so before coming back to the states so over there living was much more civilized of course we were living in nice barracks and uh, it was a lot of USO shows going through there and so uh, when you did go to Japan after Korea what were your duties like there what, what kind of the same thing I was at, uh, working in a hospital on the base um, further attending wounds and trauma that servicemen sustained, but to a higher level of care because it was uh, more civilized, it was better equipped. It was just a higher station of medicine. Now, is this the hospital where they would send the people that you were under, unable to take care of in the field in Korea? Yes. So did you see more extensive injuries or, or more? Well, I saw... I wouldn't say I saw more extensive injuries, but it was easier to treat injuries being in a hospital in Japan. You had um, better facilities. You had better uh, medical help. You had trained nurses. And it was 
like working in a hospital in the States rather than a tent in the boondocks. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what did you think of, of the, the people you served with, um, either in Korea or in Japan? Um, what were your impressions of them? How did you get along with them? The finest. Got along very well, had no problems with anybody. And I um, was very proud of my service. Did, do you remember any of their names or, or what you, no, you guys do? I can just have how you remember my name these days when I get up in the morning. Um, so were there any particular or unusual events that occurred either while you were in Korea or Japan that really stood out to you? Um, Yeah, I think that one event where I, we uh, s s flooded the ambulance in the stream and got shot at, I think that was a very outstanding traumatic experience when I realized what had happened. Mm -hmm. Taking a moderately wounded serviceman who would have lived, putting him in our ambulance, getting caught in a stream and ending up with having him killed while in the ambulance, I think that was a very traumatic experience for me, yeah. Were there any more, any other more lighthearted um, events that you can recall that kind of left a positive influence on you instead of something well, awful? Well, yeah, um, occasionally uh, we would we being myself and my corpsman would take a, a, a jeep on a, for instance, on a, a light day and drive into the nearby village where our base was situated and drive through that village. And it was so primitive that the people and especially the women with infants would walk through these muddy streets and the babies they would carry on their back. And when the babies would cry and the mother wanted to soothe them with a drink, they would lean down on a muddy stream, take a cup and feed it to the baby. And the baby would be drinking this water where up the stream there'd be cows laying in the stream and cattle uh, defecating in the stream. And I try to, through the elder of the town, try to suggest that there are better ways of taking care of the citizen, citizenry and trying to educate, having elders in the town educate these young ladies with babies that there are areas of fresher water and they should be aware that this water Water is water, but it isn't water. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And uh, we try to make an impression on the civilian life in Korea as well as, as taking care of the Americans. And and did that work? Did they? I I think so. Yes. I I they were very happy. They were very thankful that we took our time. We were always welcome when we drove our jeep into this little town. Um, People would wave and smile, and uh, I know that I was there at the time they were building a schoolhouse, and it was probably American money mm -hmm. that was given to them, and, and they were had a nice frame going up, and they would invite us, Corman and myself, in to see how the building was coming along, and I think we were greatly appreciated. So, I mean... Being, being a medic, you were seeing the worst parts of the war, all the injuries that, that occur in war, but you also saw the positive sides of what you were doing there. You were helping these villages who, who may not have right. known any better. How did you balance the two of those in your head? Was there ever a moment where you doubted whether or not what you were doing in Korea militarily was right when you just wanted to help the people, or how did you kind of justify those two? Well, I, I had a duty to serve with the military, and that was my number one function. Mm -hmm. And I served it to the best I could. And I uh, 
politically, I don't know if I was too much in favor of that war. I don't know if this is going to disrupt me or not, but um, but I had a a good feeling. I I did my job, and I had a good feeling of taking care of servicemen. But I also had a good feeling of going out and trying to educate people mm -hmm. who needed this type of education. So my service was both attending to battle injuries from our wounded and also an education part of my service where I volunteered to go into town and tell the mothers, don't feed the baby with dirty water or there's better ways of taking care of yourselves. It was a kind of a, a twosome and I got satisfaction on both sides. Which was very rare in, in, in war to, to, to feel that kind of, of satisfaction of well, helping so many people like that. It was, um, I think it was just a chance that our station, BMO 6, was within a driving distance of a village, and the village was not a civilized village in South Korea. It was the usual village that was a hundred years behind the times as far as they had no doctors there in the village. Um, however they survived, they survived. So they were, they had the problem of both war with North Korea and they also had the problem of uneducation being uneducated uh, to everyday living, and which we try to bring into this village by our presence there. And these people were very, very, very needy, and they were very, very happy that we took interest in them. Yeah, did you keep any kind of, of journals or, or...? I have videos of a lot of stuff that I had when I was over there. You took I, videos? Yeah, I had a video camera and I also had a regular Nikon that I bought in Japan and I have had slides. So I had those. Were they uh so what were the what were the videos like that you took? No, you know, walking around the city, walking around the town I should say. I have a video of BMO six, uh the base um, things like that. Um, so, as you already said, um, after Korea, you went to Japan for, for a month, and, and after that, you... Came back to the States. You came back, you came back home. Well, <clears throat> what were your final days in service like? What was going through your head as you, as you prepared to, to leave? Well, um, I was home. Um, I was attached to the U.S. Naval Air Station in Floyd Bennett Field, which was in Brooklyn, New York, which wasn't too far from my parents' home in Brooklyn, New York. So I would be doing my medical duties at Floyd Bennett Field. And I, several times a week or a couple of times a week, I'd be living at home and just driving back and forth to, my, to the field. At the time I was ready to be discharged, I had mixed feelings. I didn't really want to leave the service. And um, my parents um, were very strict about my future. <laughs> and at that time, children listened to their parents, I think, more than they do today. And when my mother says, you cannot stay in the service, you have to be a doctor. She didn't think being a, a service physician was a doctor, you know. She had, a, I had to go practice medicine. So listening to her mixed feelings, I was honorably discharged and went on to carry on further education in civilian life and went into practice. Um, so you already said that, um, as soon as you got home, you when you left, you went on to, to continue practicing medicine. Would you have 
preferred to have stayed and and stayed as a uh, yeah military doctor? I I would have. I have uh, looking back at it. I would have been retired in the military. I probably would have been now in civilian practice, but I would have had the military retirement benefits. And I, I, I enjoyed my stay in the military, and I was very proud of being a physician with the Navy and the Marines. So, so when you did leave the military and went on to do uh, practice medicine, were you doing the same kinds of treatments, or no. did you change? I changed. Uh, military medicine was mainly um, surgery. Uh, it was mainly um, trauma and um, mainly infectious diseases, which you don't see around these in the civilian life in the United States. And um, when I went back into training here in the country after I left the military, I became, went into internal medicine, which is what I do today. And uh, so, was it, was it a? Did you have to kind of readjust to, to? Oh yeah, it was a big readjustment. Yeah, I always had that. As I was training here in the states after leaving the military, I always said, "I have to go back. I have to go back." And, but that eventually petered out. Did you go back to get any further education after leaving the military, or were you yeah, already? Yeah, I, I went into an, a residency program in internal medicine. And was that through the GI Bill that you were no. able to go? Oh, okay. No, it was, they pay. It's a uh, you don't pay for your residency or internship training. They pay you okay. to do that. So yeah. Mm-hmm. And then after that, you went on and and opened up your own practice. Yeah, I found a lady, got married, and looked around, decided I was going to go practice in Connecticut, and that's where I ended up. And did you did you make any lasting connections or friendships from your time in the service? Yeah, I did. I had uh, several friends that I continued friendships with, but uh, time took its toll. Um, so, how do you think that your time in the military influenced the way you look at war or the military in general? Um, it's a good question, and, and the answers I give you are not in accord with the philosophy of our country. Um, I felt that out, World War II, and I, I did some studying and look, research on it, I think World War II was a justified war. I don't feel that Korea was. I don't feel that Vietnam was. I don't feel that Afghanistan is. I don't feel that our presence in the Middle East is doing anything. And therefore, outside of World War II, World War I, World War II, after that, I have a very down feeling, down ideas about the way our government has handled international affairs, military-wise. And do you believe what you saw while you were in Korea influenced that in any way? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think we could have, um, with the right uh, ambassadors, I think with the right people talking to people, we didn't have to go into armaments and killings and what have you. Did you, uh, did you join any veteran organizations once you left service? I remained in the U.S. Naval Reserve for a while. Um, other than that, no. I... And just overall, how do you think your time in the service affected or influenced your life? I think it had a big influence on my life. I learned a lot, both medic- medicine-wise and People-wise, I learned what the, the what most of the world is like. I mean, I was brought up in a moderate economic background in Brooklyn, New York. And outside of, at that time, I was eight, nine, 18, 19, 20, 21. I didn't know anything about the world. 
I went to medical school in Chicago, came back to New York, did a year's internship in New York, Queens General Hospital, and the rest of the world was, you may read something about it, but when you're there, it's, it's a tremendous boost of your intellectual stimulation and your emotional stimulation, something that you can never get by reading or by seeing movies of. You have to be there. And I think this was a positive, very positive stimulation of my life. And um, is there anything else that you wanted to, to discuss that maybe I didn't ask you? Um, maybe something that you experienced while you were in any place that you were stationed? Or? Well, it, it, I, I took a love of flying, and I continued flying after I got out of the military for 55 years. I just recently, because of my age uh, and other circumstances, um, stopped flying as a pilot. I'm going to continue practicing medicine, which I love forever. No thoughts of retirement. And um, I think basically my feelings about medicine have been strengthened by my service in the military, seeing how the world, the majority of the world is, which people don't know. I mean, I raised five kids here and outside of West Hartford, Simsbury, Avon, they have no idea what the world is. And no matter how you talk about it, it isn't like being there and seeing it. Seeing mothers bending down with tin cups, feeding infant babies water that a cow has been laying in upstream. It, it's just a, a, an intellectual stimulation that let's do something. Let's do something. Not shoot people. Let's bring some education. And I, I don't think we're, we're succeeding that way. Um, but at least you did. I try in, to. In your own way. Yeah. Yes, I try to. Right. Um, well, uh, if there's nothing else, uh, I would like to thank you for your service and thank you for your time in taking the time out of your day to, to meet with me and to, to give this. My pleasure. Nice meeting with you and nice talking about it. Thank you.